Second work was a militaristic invasion of the country, the destruction of the Germanic tradition, which was where God's providence had gone to, and then the gradual recovery, or you might say restoration, of that foundation which was there and was wiped out, which is basically a thousand years of history. The last thousand years of English history is about how to, how to get back to the way it was before uh, the Norman Conquest. <clears throat> Okay, so part of this then was the Enlightenment. I'm only going to look at the English Enlightenment and Scottish Enlightenment, not at the French and German ones. Oh, this is not so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. I'm a normal I'm 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 also including the Russian one. I'm not going to go I'm sorry. I'm just narrowing it down. <laughs> okay, so, so what was going on here? These, it's a concept, you know, we talk about wars between Catholics and Protestants. And a lot of people felt religion causes wars, religion causes conflict. People are always arguing about, do you believe this and do you believe that? Still do. Should you be baptised by being sprinkled or by full immersion, etc., etc. And people are killing each other over these sorts of matters. And a lot of people, intellectuals, have thought, you can't carry on like this. We need, <coughs> we need to have a much simpler form of religion. Just a very simple one, not all this complicated thing like the Nicene Creed and all this other stuff and the complications of this, that and the other. So <clears throat> these basically <clears throat> were the deists. So again, you can see it's that sort of time of this religious wars that were going on, the English uh, Civil War, the Commonwealth, etc., etc. And it's a Lord Herbert of Sherbury. <coughs> Sherbury is in Yorkshire, isn't it? I think. Where were they? Anyway. So he said, okay, we have to have a theology based only on reason. Yeah? You can't have it based upon revelation because it's so... How can you believe, you know, people walking on water? I can believe on floating accent, accent. I can believe all this sort of stuff. You have to have a theology based on only on reason that everybody can accept because it's rational. It makes sense. It's not, there's no superstition in it. So he said, okay, these are the five principles of deism. There's one supreme God. And he ought to be worshipped. Why should God be worshipped? Because God is a creator. Because God created us, he is our creator, therefore, logically, he should be worshipped. Virtue and piety are the chief parts of divine worship. Now, it's not about do you believe in the three and one and the one and three and all this sort of stuff. The most important thing is living a virtuous, a good life, and being pious in whatever way suits you. <coughs> then we ought to be sorry for our sins and repent of them. Yeah. If you do something wrong, you should feel regret and say sorry and repent. And then divine goodness dispenses rewards and punishments both in this life and after it. That's all you need to believe. And all the other stuff is just like add-ons. So you try to create a, ration, a, a, a rational religion. Anyway, <coughs> so the other deists, following on from him, people called Toland, people called Collins, they started then to rationally analyze the Bible. Let's analyze the Bible using reason. If you analyze the Bible using reason, the whole thing falls to pieces. You look at the four Gospels. The Gospel accounts of the crucifixion are very different. The Gospel accounts of the, of the trials of Jesus are very different. And you think, well, which one is, if it's supposed to be the Word of God, if it's supposed to be true, how do you explain all these contradictions? That's one of the reasons why the church wouldn't allow the Bible to be translated from Latin into the vernacular. Because then you get ordinary people reading it and start asking all these annoying questions. <laughs> and priests don't like to be annoyed. <laughs> they want to say, this is what it says. I know you can't read Latin, but that's what it says. <laughs> and this is what, these are the only bits that you can read. I mean, don't worry about all the other stuff. <clears throat> anyway, so, totally, so the Bible then, as I said, from, um, what's his name? James I has been translated into English. There's a Bible in every single church, had a Bible, and it was attached to the church by a chain, so nobody could run off with it. Mm. <coughs> and so these people, they started the beginnings of biblical criticism, started analysing the Bible using reason, and said it all started to sort of unravel. <coughs> and so it became very easy then for it to unravel so much that people said, well, I don't believe in any of this stuff. Yeah? And so... Uh, so there's a tendency then within deism to go towards atheism. Tendency. Anyway, <clears throat> within the Church of England, though, since the deist was going in that sort of direction, 
towards atheism, towards materialism, then they were intellectually defeated by some Anglican clerics. There's William Law, who wrote a serious course of devout and holy life. Very profound analysis. <clears throat> and Bishop Butler, who defended uh, religion. And so the deist, so the Church of England was intellectually capable of engaging with the deist arguments and defeating them. And showing them that not everything is <coughs> rational. There's lots of things which actually cannot be explained by reason. So they show the limitations of reason. Whereas so they thought, you know, Everything should be based only on reason. So they showed the limitations of reason. And so as a result of that, days and then declined within England. <clears throat> and it remained intellectually respectable to believe in God and to study the Bible, etc. Et so you might say, in our language, Satan's invasion of the Cain type view was defeated. So the Enlightenment then is, you know, relative to the Reformation sort of came. So it was defeated. It didn't become atheistic or materialistic. And so as, as English empir empiricism developed, <coughs> empiricism is knowledge comes from um, experiments, experiments and, you know, from observation, experiment, Evidence. does it work, that sort of thing. Evidence. Right. Evidence. Yeah. Evidence, yeah. Anyway, one of the first of these was Thomas Leviathan, who wrote a political work, but also did a lot of um, work in geometry. Anyway, most famous is John Locke, who is an empiricist. And he, in his book which, on the treaties of government, they outlined the basic foundations for liberal democracy. A lot of it drew, drawing on what was in the Bible, actually. And also, he wrote another very important book called Reasonable Christianity. So, even though he's a leading empiricist, he believed in God and he was a Christian. So, he wanted to present Christianity as being reasonable, that all reasonable, intelligent people should believe in it. <coughs> And then there's Isaac Newton came. He was a great, obviously, you know, phys physics, maths, calculus. Also got involved in alchemy and wrote commentaries upon the Bible. And he thought his commentaries on the Bible were more important than his works on gravity. Anyway, history judge otherwise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so again, you know, the scientific community were also carried on believing in God. It was intellectually respectable to believe in God. Bishop Barclay, another of the next most important empiricists, was actually a bishop. So the whole Enlightenment tradition in England developed within the church. It didn't develop in the universities. It didn't develop outside the church amongst the intelligentsia. It developed within the church. And so you have this unity then of the Hebraic and Hellenistic traditions. <clears throat> so, so the truth then comes from experience. The only problem with this is it needs to descend into skepticism. Because experience is multi, you know, all kinds of things. No, it's not rational, it's not uniform. Mm. And so it can easily become very skeptical about things, which I think is quite helpful. And in terms of religious developments at this time, <clears throat> on the Hebraic kind of side, there was John Wesley. And uh, he was an Anglican, and he had a profound experience of. Uh, with, with God, started preaching, and as he preached, people got converted. He was accused of being an enthusiast, he was being spirit filled, and you know, well, it's like a bad word in England. He was too enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was pushed out and not allowed to preach in uh, Anglican Church, the Church of England anymore. So he preached in the, in the streets, he preached in the fields, and you know, lots and lots of people were converted. And thousands, tens of thousands of people that had a profound experience of God of repentance and weeping and crying. And you know, he thought, well, what do we do with all these people? So he set up what's called circles, Methodist circles, where they would methodically develop their faith. So the name Methodism comes from, he had a method for people to develop <coughs> spiritually, focus on the spiritual development. It's not enough just to be saved, you actually have to become holy. Yeah, very much emphasis on holiness. And uh, one of the things I like saying to I love most is he said, we have to agree to disagree. Yeah, that's great. He's involved in lots of arguments and controversy. He said, okay, let's agree to disagree. Let's remain friends. We don't agree about this, but so what? Friendship is more important, or love is more important than whether we agree or disagree. And so focus very much upon personal and social regeneration. So a lot of the people who got involved in charitable activities, social activities, trade unions, all these things 
were people who came from the Methodist tradition. So, you know, even within trade unions up until recently, branches of trade unions were called chapels, based upon a Methodist kind of practice. We don't have Methodist churches, Methodist chapels. Okay, another one was George Whitfield, uh, Evangelical Revival, went to America, but, you know, off the Great Awakening in American colonies. And then also you had the development of all these other people, Quakers, Congregationalists, different kind of Christianity, they would elect their own ministers, the Presbyterians who were governed by, you know, Council of Elders, Baptists, lots of independent churches. So I said there was a de facto religious freedom and pluralism. This is way back in the 18th century. Scottish Enlightenment, <coughs> and those of you, David, who are interested in Scotland, we had John Knox, I mentioned, who was the equivalent to, um, there was no equivalent in England, really, and um, who was very influenced by uh, Calvinists, because he spent some time in Geneva, part of the Scottish Reformation. <coughs> and there's David Hume, who's my favourite philosopher. He was empiricist, he wrote a treatise on human nature, very grounded in human nature, what works. You know, you have to have a society which, fun which is in, in tune with human nature. Mm -hmm. So they developed the idea of the free market as a humanist and also again of liberal democracy. Much deeper thinker than John Locke, much deeper. And he was, a, he was an agnostic. You could see the value of religion, the functional value of religion for society, but he himself, he demolished all the traditional arguments to prove that God exists. He's just demolished them all. Aquinas. Then you have Adam Smith, another Scot, um, again another humanist, who wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations, which is a popular one. The Theory of Moral Sentiments is about uh, several volumes which he kept on revising, which is like a pot boiler. And again, this is the whole focus upon how to create a moral society. How do people develop morally? Now it's his focus, and what kind of society do you need? And what kind of economic system do you need that's going to help people to develop morally? And he said free market was the best for enabling people's moral development, to be responsible for their lives. Another one, Francis Hutchison, another important moral philosopher was the utilitarian, Robert Burns, mm -hmm. who was a poet. <clears throat> and might sing his song later on. <clears throat> and the interesting thing about all these people, philosophers generally, <coughs> They would argue with each other and slag each other off. <laughs> That's the tradition in, in France, Germany especially. They'd slag each other off. These, philosophers, these people, they used to meet up in Edinburgh in a pub and they'd get blind drunk and they'd be talking philosophy and supporting each other <coughs> <coughs> and discussing with each other. And it's different. The Scottish Enlightenment is like that. Known for that. So they'd all meet up in a pub Edinburgh, I think it was. They would drink and they'd talk philosophy and they'd share ideas. So it's very much a very different kind of spirit. As opposed to English Enlightenment? Uh, English Enlightenment took place within the church, this took place within the pub. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I it's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they were, I mean, they were, they believed in, I mean, often were agnostic believers. The church at that time was very kind of strict and they wouldn't fit in. <coughs> but another one, Thomas Reed, this was common sense. It's a very grounded kind of philosophy. It's not like Hegel or Kant or all these philosophers, which really abstract. It was a very much grounded humanistic philosophy. Yeah, this is all Lang Syne. for the sake of all times. And it's all about friendship. Should old acquaintance, should old friends be forgotten and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgotten? And all that anxiety. For the sake of old times, we should never forget. And, you know, take a cup of kindness yet. Surely you'll buy your pint cup. Scots. <laughs> so, I mean, Robert Burns himself was very much involved in Scottish Enlightenment Circle. <coughs> and, um, you know, it's about being paddled in the stream, you know, we've done all these things together, so we shouldn't forget friends. So, 
as I said, the Scottish Enlightenment <coughs> friendship was more important than intellectual agreement. Friendship's more important than anything. Yeah. Um, Isn't that true? Yes, I agree it is. Yeah, I'm just saying that was a characteristic well, of... Well, I'm very pleased to hear. No, I think it's really important. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't, it doesn't matter what people believe. They're friends. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're the hand of my trusty friend who gave me a hand in that. So this is a sort of idea, which again is very much the Scottish and Light of the theme. You give me your hand, give me your hands, but you can sing it like that. <laughs> Yeah, of course, yeah, but then they go and drink again the next day. <laughs> yeah, it's just, anyway, they're, they're Scots, they're not English. This is a different, very different kind of culture. Anyway, so, as I said, um, Oliver Cromwell died. His son didn't want the job. You know, <coughs> very, much, very much not like <coughs> the sons of traditional dictators. And so they thought, well, who's going to be in charge. So they thought, okay, well, let's invite, we need, let's have the restoration of the monarchy. So they invited, um, who was it was, Charles II, who was living in France, which is not a good place to live. Anyway, so he came along and uh, passed the Act of Uniformity. Did, did Parliament invite him back? Yes. Oh. Yeah, they need somebody, to, it has to be the head of state. Yeah. But it wasn't going to be a king on the same basis as Charles I was the king. Mm. You know, not. When I have to keep cutting kings' heads off. You know, they just have to know their place. They have to lead a king, but he has to function within the law, within his constitutional position. And that's what then. <coughs> anyway, so he was uh, rather Catholicish. James II then was fairly Catholic and had a declaration of indulgence, which was interesting. So he declared religious freedom, basically. <clears throat> the Church of England, which had now been restored with bishops and everything, because um, the Act of Uniformity brought the Church of England back to the way it was, um, which had bishops and Common Book of Prayer and all these different things, which had been lost during the, the Commonwealth period. But James II had a Declaration of Indulgence, <coughs> uh, where people could be Catholic or whatever they wanted to be. Church of England wasn't so happy with that. And so, um, <clears throat> Anyway, so James II then was, people felt, you know, I mean, he, was going, he felt he was trying to restore Catholicism in Britain through this. First, he let the Catholic, give the Catholics freedom of worship and remove all the, the restrictions upon Catholics. And people worried that's what he was you know, aiming to do, was to make you know, Catholic again. And then he had a son, and people thought, well, you know, it's just going to carry on like this. <clears throat> so this glorious revolution. The year after his declaration of indulgence, <coughs> and uh, William was <coughs> William of Orange and Mary. So Mary was the daughter of Charles, as far as I remember, and she married William of Orange, who's the Duke of. Uh, uh, anyway, so they invited over by Parliament <coughs> to become <coughs> king. So it's the very it's the only time in English history where you had a dual monarchy. So he was a king and she, she was a queen, not because she was married to the king, she was a queen in her own right, mm -hmm. which, yeah, because she was the daughter of the king. <coughs> so that's, whereas uh, when Victoria married Albert, he always remained a prince. Mm -hmm. uh, when the queen married Philip, he always remained a prince. Whereas uh, he was the only one to elevate and become a king in his own right. So what happens nowadays with Charles and the famous queen? Queen Camilla. Well, Camilla's only queen because she's married to him. She's not the queen in her own right. Mm -hmm. But it's called queen. Yeah. It's not called queen. She's, she's a queen, but it's a different... She's not... I mean, officially, she's a queen consort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to shorten it, you just call her queen. But officially, she's a queen consort because she's the wife of the king. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, she was a queen in her own right because she was the daughter of the king. Queen Mary. And he was the one who got elevated to become king. So, anyway, it's just the way it was. David? Uh, so, are you saying the difference is, is that one is queen by birth and one is queen by marriage? Yeah. Brilliant. So, yeah. better than me, David. At the end of the day, it's the same thing. <laughs> no, it's not. No, no, no. No, no, no. 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 it's the same <laughs> by status, but no, it's, it, no it's, it's very different. No. 
But Ca Queen Camilla can't stand it. Well, I can't stand saying Queen Camilla. I don't say uh, it. Uh, that's Queen fine. Camilla doesn't have any less staples than this one. Oh, she does. She, <laughs> Queen Camilla. She does. Queen Camilla was called by the Queen Elizabeth. Yes, but she has no, exactly no, the same... She, no, but she was called Queen Camilla <coughs> until the Queen died. Mm -hmm. And Charles said, can't be bothered with that long name, just call her Queen, just ignore it. But <laughs> from a lineage viewpoint, she's not the daughter of royalty. Mm -hmm. And a consort is somebody who goes out with somebody. Huh? Yes. It's like an escort <laughs> ship with the main ship. So she escorts the king. She's not queen in her own right. But she yeah. has a uh, decision making. No, 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 I don't think she does. But even the queen, even queen even Elizabeth. Sorry, even what? Queen Elizabeth. No, queen Elizabeth. <laughs> Philip, they've had conversations, but she was the one who had the authority to make decisions, not him. Yeah. Whereas they're here, both of them had that authority. Mm. Mm. And we did. So. I understand now. It's all about the authority. Mm. Well, and the authority about comes, the boys. Yeah, you know, it comes from you know, lineage in that sense. Are you born to be? I was thing? a queen in my marriage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it, I was. William, was it harmonious? Oh, so was it harmonious at that time? I was a queen in my marriage. Well, I don't know. Well, yeah. well, you know, I had marriage, authority. I mean, all, no marriage is completely harmonious. You know, I mean, the Philip and um, Elizabeth was remarkable. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so William of Orange, yeah, Battle of the Boy, that was in Ireland, you know, the piece of the Protestants there. And it should, uh, you know, an act of toleration, I uh, can't remember more details of that, Declaration of Rights. But anyway, the whole thing was that the king then could only be the king within Parliament, within the law. It's a constitutional monarchy, this whole principle is a constitutional monarchy was firmly established at this time. <clears throat> And then uh, a bit later on, the Union of the English and Scottish Parliaments. Um, that happened for various, um, anyway, Scotland went through various economic collapses, the English said they'd pay the bills. <coughs> and then Scotland, but the part of that, interestingly, about this union <coughs> was like, was this. Scotland kept its own church. <coughs> church of England, Church of Scotland. I'm not going to repeat the idea of the Church of England taking over. Tried that, doesn't work. Let them have their own Church of Scotland, Church of England, <coughs> a separate legal system. Up until very recently, if you're a Scot you're either a Scottish lawyer and you can practice Scottish law in the courts, or you're an English lawyer and practice only in England. Because there's a different legal system. Scots law is Scots law, more of a civil kind, more like the continental civil law, and English law is based on common, common law. <clears throat> so they kept their own system, so again, that's a good way to bring unity, it's not by trying to expect uniformity. And then mm -hmm. Scots kept their own educational system up until today, mm -hmm. four years at university, and until recently the Scottish schooling system was better than it was in England. Mm -hmm. They kept their own currency, Bank of England issues notes, the Bank of Scotland issues its own notes, the Royal Bank of Scotland, Clydesdale, mm -hmm. <coughs> Quite a few different notes which are issued by different banks within the United Kingdom and Isle of Man. And, and so, yeah, they're worth the same now. They're interchangeable. But when it started off, this is the deal. We're going to have a union of parliaments, but <coughs> we're going to have our own separate systems. <coughs> so they work more or less the same now. Um, there's still a lot of difference. Still different. And the Scots increasingly wanting to become independent because, you know, anyways, mm -hmm. having their own parliament again and lots of things going that way. It's complicated, mm -hmm. what I can say. <laughs> so, anyway, so as all, at the same time as all that was going on, particularly since that period of <coughs> Commonwealth under, under Cromwell, there's a lot of freedom including, you know, freedom to experiment. People stop, you know, up until then, there was lots of people farming strips. Sometimes you see this, you go to the countryside, you can see the hills are like that. The fields are like this, because each person or family would have a strip of land outside the village. Everybody had one or two good strips of land, everybody had one or two 
whole strips of land. So it's this idea everyone should have a bit of good land, a bit of bad land. It's very inefficient in terms of. <clears throat> so it started moving. So yes, well, so anyway, started to have crop rotation, which produced more crops, and then uh, better plows. Uh, the enclosures came along. So instead of having strip farming, you could combine all the strips together into a large field and work it out like that. A lot of injustices happened at that time, without a doubt, but it meant the possibility of modern agriculture and modern farming. <clears throat> the common rights were removed, There's still bits of common around, common land. <clears throat> Free market <clears throat> in terms of no tariffs, so you're selling agricultural goods. Transportation infrastructure improved, better roads. Canals, of course, meant you could transport huge volumes of anything from one part of the country to the other. Otherwise, to do it on a road, well, there were no tarmac roads then, mm -hmm. it's just in a rickety old carriage, and be, you couldn't take much, it was really expensive. You couldn't go very far because the horses would get worn out. <coughs> but with canals, when you could transport vast uh, weights and amounts of things. Mm -hmm. In the later railways. So land conversion, land drains, reclamation, <coughs> draining the marshes in Norfolk, the bends and all that sort of thing. Farm size increased selective breeding of animals and fertilizers. And so the effect of this was this. It didn't happen, it's not like revolution is the wrong word, because it happened over a long period of time. <coughs> But in agrarian societies, four families produce enough food for five families. That is, for themselves and one more family. Not much manpower is available for non-agricultural activity. <clears throat> in the course of the agricultural revolution, one family began to produce enough food for five families. <coughs> much manpower was liberated from agriculture and became available for industry. Thus, the agricultural revolution made possible the development of large towns and cities and the industrial revolutions. So all the people living in cities, there was now enough food for them to be able to eat, whereas before there never was. And that's a huge transformation change. And then that became the basis for the industrial revolution, which <laughs> the principle said began in England, and explain why, rose out of God's providence to restore the living environment. One, two, for the ideal world, promoted trade with the empire and the government. So, okay, this is before the Industrial Revolution took place. <clears throat> this is the workforce. Children were sent down the mines, all in these little tunnels to dig for coal. <clears throat> Miserable. Mm -hmm. This little boy here would spend all day opening and closing his door so that this little wagon could go through. That's the way it was. There were no there's no machinery, there are no pickaxes like there are today. <clears throat> that was the basis for the Industrial Revolution, child labor. But there was no other way to do it at that time. And then gradually you started to get more and more coal and more and more iron ore dug out of the ground, and so it's possible to start making iron. <clears throat> this is uh, the very first bridge in the entire world made of iron. Iron Bridge, <coughs> 1779. It's amazing. It's every single one of these little girders here is individually, individually shaped. They're not standard pieces of metal like you do today. Every single one is individually shaped. Sorry, where is that bridge? Where, hmm? where is that bridge? It's something near Telford. Telford? Shropshire. Mm -hmm. um, just off the end, something or other. And so iron making developed there. <coughs> And a lot of the people involved with this, they were Quakers. Abraham Darby was a Quaker. He developed iron production using coke. So before then, iron, coal itself has too many impurities, <coughs> but then he developed coke, where you get a much purer heat without all the impurities of the sulfur and everything in the coal, which meant it's able to develop iron production of good quality iron. <coughs> and then it was cheap quality iron, and all sorts of things could be done with this cheap iron that was being produced. It also meant you could start building machines. So there's more iron and eventually steel. So you have the mechanization of textile production. Again, you can see this in a, in a clip in the, in the science museum. And then with this, you've got the development of factories, huge increase in productivity, the lowering of cost of 
manufacture, which meant everybody was able to wear clothes. You know, cheap clothes, cheap textiles made out of cotton, which came mostly from America, which of course in the southern states was a slave economy. But it became a possibility then of producing these cheap textiles and clothes. <coughs> but again, who's working in the factories? You have these huge machines, and they try to keep the machines going all the time. But if something went wrong, then the little child would be sent into, you know, they're small enough, be sent into the machine to try and fix it. And sometimes there'd be an accident, and the arm would be cut, cut, cut off or something. And, but again, that was the labor. That was the way in which things developed. And you have to think, well, it was horrible, but was there any other way? No other way. Those because days, at, that stage, so at that stage, everything was so underdeveloped. And, it took time to develop the machinery, it took time to develop this, took time to develop that, etc. etc. What do you think this little boy's job was? Chimney sweep. Chimney sweep. So, you know, <clears throat> you go up the chimney with this little brush and clean the chimney. And yeah, sometimes they get stuck. You know, but how else are you going to clean the chimneys? And uh, anyway, that's that's how it developed based upon child labor and also other people working. And then things developed further, <coughs> got steam power, in, this is James Watt's steam engine, with Scott <coughs> developed this, and uh, it could be used in mines. So instead of having these little children doing all these jobs in the mines, you could actually have steam power. And so it meant that all those things that were done by human beings could now be done by machines. <coughs> and these machines are often very, very powerful, so you could dig much deeper than you could before, you could do all sorts of things. And also meant you could make factories away from water power. So up until then, the only source of power was the river. And you'd have a water mill, water wheel, you know, for grinding the flour and things. Which again, very, couldn't produce very much. Now you could have factories away from water power. And then transport developed, canals that I mentioned, railways, ships, factories. So the Stoke-on-Trent, for example, the potteries, they produced lots and lots of china. Yeah? and crockery. How do you transport it to another part of the country? But if you put it in a box, then you put it on a, in a wagon, it gets shaken to pieces, and all, most of the stuff gets broken. But if you can just load it onto a barge, and it can very smoothly travel from one city to another, slowly, but very smoothly, you end up with stuff not getting broken, and the transportation costs are much less. So canals, railways later, came along later, and ships, and all these sorts of things about. And then, of course, the, the financial markets in the city of London, where anybody could go <clears throat> in a very clear legal system, which is an independent legal system, independent of the king, independent of parliament, they would just apply the law. And so it became a safe place to buy and sell or exchange commodities. So you had, I mean, they were almost hardly any left now. There was Covent Garden, was a flower market, Billingsgate was a fish market. One meat market, Smithfields, the meat market. So all these <coughs> markets within the city of London, where people would bring their produce from all over the country, and they knew they could safely sell it without somebody coming along and robbing them. So they didn't have organised criminal gangs, you know, with a protection racket. Anybody could go from anywhere in the country to London. They could sell their produce to whomever they wanted, and it was a market. It wasn't rigged. Anybody could sell meat, anybody could sell flowers, anybody could sell these things. There was no monopoly. So this is, again, <coughs> very important. <coughs> and this led to international trade. The City of London, till today, is very, you know, has a very prestigious role. Yeah, so that's how London Stock Exchange... Stock yeah. Exchange, insurance, all, all these things, all these financial services have developed because they're a very clear legal system. Absolutely. You can't bribe an English, you can't bribe an English judge. Mm -hmm. That's the point. So even contracts signed between <coughs> companies in other countries, <coughs> they say we want to have our disputes adjudicated in London, because both sides knew you can't bribe an English judge. <coughs> Cross to raise capital, for starting new businesses, borrowing money, it's transfer of risk, insurance, all these things happen. All sort of happening around about the same sort of time. So how important was it? <coughs> <clears throat> the Industrial Revolution, the most important event in the history of humanity since the domestication of animals and plants, which was about 10, 20,000 years ago. Yeah, why is that? 
For the first time in history, the living standards for the masses of ordinary people have begun to undergo sustained growth. Nothing remotely like this economic behavior has happened before. If you look at the world population, the whole of human history is like this. And suddenly, it goes up. Why? Because the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution meant it's possible to the world to support a far larger population than was ever possible in human history at a far more comfortable living standard. <clears throat> and then all this you know, stuff, technology and democracy, everything that they exported to other places. But the interesting thing is also who were these people? They were non conformists. None of these people were members of the Church of England. <clears throat> Over exaggeration, of course. <laughs> because you know the, establishment, the Church of England was, was the establishment. You could only go to Oxford or Cambridge University if you were a member of the Church of England. <clears throat> you could only teach at Oxford or Cambridge University if you are an ordained cleric. So what do, what do all these Baptists and Independents and Quakers and whatnots? What do they do? They can't go and get that kind of education, which means they can't go into the professions. They can't become lawyers. They can't rise up through the establishment, the civil service, they can't. A whole, a whole lot of avenues to the establishment and to power and prestigious jobs is closed off. <coughs> so they're all very intelligent people. And so they started thinking because they were free thinkers. A lot of them were free thinkers. So they started becoming inventors. And so the Quakers then, they started the iron industry and the banking sector in this country started by Quakers. That's a very powerful thing. Why Quakers? My goodness. Because Quakers lead a very simple life. They don't like ostentation. People knew, if I, if I, this, if I let this Quaker look after my money, he's not going to spend it on himself. Because it's against his conscience. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Barclays Bank, and a lot of these banks, they were started by Quakers. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because they were known, and they could be trusted not to run off with the money. They're still very strong, the Quakers. Yeah, well, not compared to... Anyway what they were like. But anyway, as a lot of these things have changed. I'm just saying this is how things developed in terms of God's providence. <coughs> the Huguenots, they were refugees, Protestant refugees from France. <coughs> they started glass making, machine tools, steel making, textiles. <coughs> and of course there was slavery. Actually, and people often say, you know, Britain was very heavily involved in the slave trade, transatlantic slave trade. But um, Portugal actually is the largest slave trader in Brazil. So, but if you look at the economic status or position of Portugal, it's not a rich country. Yeah, what? Is not a rich country? Sorry. It's not. Portugal's not a rich country. Oh, right, right, okay. Even I though understand. it's very he more heavily involved in the slave trade than yes. Britain. Yes. And in Britain itself, there's never been any slavery until since about the 13th century. Legal, there never legally been slavery. There was a sort of people were like slaves. There was never a legal status. And so <clears throat> once there was a, a British person who was abroad, he, had, he owned a slave, which is an abominable thing to own another human being. Every human being is God's property. And he brought his slave to Britain, the slave ran away, and he went to court. This is in the, the 18th century. He went to court and he said, I want to have my slave returned to me. And the judge said, well, I've looked through the laws. There's no legal basis for slavery. There's no law saying that this person belongs to you. <laughs> so there's no law to enforce. <laughs> there's never been a law. You know, like in America, there was a legal basis for slavery. There were you know, different congresses or whatever passed laws. There had never been such laws like that in this country. And then, you know, people gradually realized that slave trade is an abominable thing. And so eventually the slave trade was abolished. And, and then after that, the slaves themselves in the British Empire, in the Caribbean, <coughs> they were then <coughs> freed. <coughs> but under slavery, if you're a slave, and the historical custom, the only way you can stop being a slave is you, either somebody buys you out, which is what Christians often did, they buy slaves, other Christian slaves out, so they're no longer slaves, mm -hmm. or you could earn enough money to buy your own freedom. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is Parliament then said, okay, we will buy, we will set all these slaves free because we will buy them and free them. And so their freedom was bought then by the British taxpayers, it took about 100 years to 
paid off. Um, anyway, that's what uh, is happening. I think this is a better way to do it than what this is in America, which is just to have a civil war, which is, you know, it's a peaceful way to get rid of, it's a peaceful way to abolish the institution of slavery is by buying all the slaves their freedom. How else are you going to do it? <laughs> Can't do it any other way. That's peaceful. So why did the Reformation, why did all this happen in Britain then? I mean, is it because English people are more, or British people are more intelligent than other people? No, I'm interested all. to hear that. Yeah, why, why did the agriculture industrial revolution happen here first, and not elsewhere? Well, first of all, <coughs> because of this freedom of religion, which we saw how it developed, you know, with Protestant, you know, very bloody development, Catholics, Protestants killing each other, and eventually realized we can't carry on doing this. And then this whole situation with uh, Cromwell and the rise of deism. And so you ended up with freedom of religion. So the important thing about freedom of religion is not just you're free to go and worship what, wherever you want, or you're free to believe whatever you want. It means there's a freedom of ideas. Yeah. Whereas in Catholic countries, if you didn't believe in this, then you're called a heretic and you can be punished or put in prison. Do. Yeah. Oh, I tell you. Okay, so with the freedom of religion then, Come from freedom of ideas. You can think whatever you want to think without being afraid of being arrested and burnt at the stake. You know, <clears throat> with the freedom of ideas, you can play with ideas. You can be creative without being afraid of somebody getting on your case and saying you're not doing it the way it's always been done. You're not. You're, and then with the freedom to experiment, let's see if we can do it differently. Let's see if we can plough these fields differently. I know our ancestors have always done it like this. But maybe there's a better way to do it. And you're free to experiment and to do things differently. That's the point of freedom of religion, at least the freedom of this, and then the freedom to publish. So all during all this time with the empiricists and the deists and everything, people are publishing all kinds of booklets and pamphlets and all kinds of subjects. And it didn't matter if it annoyed the king. It didn't matter if it annoyed the parliament. It didn't matter because they didn't have the authority or the power to go and stop people doing this. And John Milton was one of the main advocates of absolute freedom to publish, freedom to speak. <clears throat> you talk about the 18th century. This has happened, no, it happened over hundreds of years, gradual development. Yeah, yeah. From the 16th century with... Because now it's very threatening. Yeah, I'm just saying this is how it developed. Yeah. Um, and there was this absolute freedom to publish and to say anything you wanted. And this, of course, meant you could develop, science could develop, you know, because you could experiment, you could publish articles and things, and then the development of technology, which meant the Industrial Revolution, all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> and then also, secondly, <coughs> development of democracy and the rule of law. So you saw that was one of the great contributions of Oliver Cromwell, was we want to have a law-governed society, not a society or you know, a country governed by a king, or by some bureaucrat, or some this or that, but just the law. Either you're allowed to do it, you know, if the law, so that's the basic principle of English law, if it's not against the law, you can do it. Whereas in many countries, the civil law, show, show me where in the law it says you're allowed to do this. The law, doesn't, the, the, the law doesn't say you're allowed to do it, therefore you're not allowed to do it. Whereas in England, it's the opposite principle, if you're not allowed to do it, you can do it. Which means you can do anything you want, as long as you don't break the law whole idea of freedom. <clears throat> so you don't need to ask anybody's permission from the state. You want to build a factory there? You can, it's your land, you can build it. <clears throat> you want to do you want to sell this or make this? You can do it. You don't have to get anybody's permission to do these things. And the freedom of association, people sit around in clubs and create journals and articles and political parties, all kinds of different kinds of societies about different things, and they didn't need to ask anybody's permission. Sometimes people ask me, is the Unification Church registered in Britain? I said, no. Is it what? It registered. Is it? No. There's no place to go to register your religion. Yeah. <laughs> it's registered as a charity. No, there's a charity, but if we didn't have a charity, it would still be a church. Yeah. That's the point. It so happens that we have a charitable, there is charitable status, and that the way the finances all work. But if the government took away our charitable status, all those years ago, we'll still be able to function and we just would have to pay tax. 
but we'll still be a religion, unification church, we can still worship, we can still just own property, do all these things. We just wouldn't have this tax exempt status at all. So anybody can start a church or a religion in this country, you don't have to ask anybody's permission. Whereas in other countries, you have to register with the state. So we're not registered with anybody because there is no register. It's a free country. <laughs> and the independent judiciary, the rule of law. <clears throat> and then finally, <clears throat> there's property ownership. You can, again, this goes back to the Anglo Saxon thing, they're freeholders. It took a long time to re establish this idea of freeholders. Even though the, the Crown owns everything, at the end of the day, practically speaking, you're a freeholder. You can own it. You can buy it, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want with it. <laughs> and the free market as well. It's safe and secure to buy and sell without permission. So what are these three things? Three blessings. Three blessings. <laughs> free to worship God, mind and body, worship God however you want to. Democracy, which is about, this is about the relationship, you know, internal relationship, relationship with God. This one here is about a relationship between people. Democracy, rule of law, freedom of association, all those things. An expansion of the second blessing. This one here is the right to become an owner, a true owner, and having you. dominion over the creation. Because so because you. these things were established in Britain, that's why God was able to bless. That's why all these things could take place. Because a society based upon the three blessings was established. Okay. Britain's also, you know, it's even Asian role. It is <coughs> past 11. Okay, I'll just finish this bit, then I'll stop. Okay, even Asian role, so, you know, Father will talk about that. So, as even nation, then Britain gave birth to three Adam nations. <coughs> gave birth to the first Israel, Israel became independent in 1948, before then it was under the British mandate. Gave birth to the United States of America. Painful birth. <laughs> Very rebellious child. <laughs> Teenager, but anyway, it happened. And also was involved in uh, the third, establishing a third uh, career, which I mentioned, not just through the Korean War, but else, other ways too. <coughs> also had many colonies. You yeah, know, I mean, empire in itself is not a good thing. There should not be any empires. But anyway, if you look at, if you compare the British Empire with the German one, the Russian one, the Spanish one, the Portuguese one, the Italian one, it's it doesn't come off so badly. <laughs> no. And through this then was the spread of Christianity, but also the spread of technology. All these things that were developed in Britain through the empire, they were all spread out to the rest of the world. The you know, ex ex uh, transmission of technology. We didn't keep it to ourselves. You wonder, you know, you go to Switzerland, they've got nice railways. Who built the, the, sway, the railways in Switzerland? British railway engineers. No. <laughs> yeah, it's a fact that all these British engineering and technologists, that it weren't kept here, they actually went to other European and other countries around the world and they built and shared the technology with the rest of the world. Yeah, in, in the Shinkansen yeah. has its origin in Scotland. Who? The Shinkansen, the Japanese military, military. has its oh, origin okay. right. in Scotland. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's got used to have the biggest car factory in the entire world at one point. And then, it's interesting, you've got the British Commonwealth. They're all pretty much liberal democracies. <clears throat> um, you don't have a Spanish Commonwealth, or a German Commonwealth, or a Belgian Commonwealth, or a Portuguese Commonwealth, or a Russian Commonwealth. And so it's a concept. Sorry? It's, it's a very British concept. A what? The Commonwealth. No, it's just the idea that all these... Former yeah. colonies, they actually still want to be connected to Britain. Mm. Whereas uh, you don't find South American countries wanting to be connected to Spain? No. 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 It's a different relationship. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah. All the point I'm making. <clears throat> I'm not saying it's, you know, it's not perfect. Lots of terrible things took place. I'm and you know, I read about the history of Uganda where I was born. And it was appalling. And Kenya, the Mau Mau. It was just horrible stuff happened. Without a doubt, never mind slavery. But at the end of the day, well, you know, it could have been worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all I can say. Could have been longer. But also, I believe Great Britain wants to have a relationship with the colonies. 
Oh yeah, of course. I think yeah. it's more yeah, well, more Great Britain trying to do that. It's the mixture of both. Sure. Just trying to you know moving from independence, trying to make it a smooth transition. And so, you know, the Queen attitude is always, well, if you don't want me to be your Queen, that's fine. You know, um, it's never important. Okay, your father then said you should have married a new princess, as, you know, from the Eve nation. And if it had worked out like that, the Queen would have been ahead, I should replace this with the King now, ahead of 16 countries and also ahead of a church. It would have been, say, marriage made in heaven. So, this is what the father said. The true mother would have come up, if things had worked out differently in Korea, which is another story altogether, if things had worked out very differently in Korea, the true mother would have come out of the Christian realm, perhaps she would have been a British woman. It could be, why not? Once the world found why foundation had been accomplished, I would have picked the true mother on a world level. Imagine if the royal princess of England, or a royal princess of England, had become the true mother. I'm only interested in one thing, how to restore the world. And it's because our movement was rejected by Korean Christianity that our boundaries became so limited. If we'd been supported by the Korean, if we had been supported, the Korean movement would have immediately become insignificant. Because the movement would have become worldwide and universal, with no boundaries. <clears throat> Let's say that the true mother had come out, had come from Great Britain, the source of the English-speaking culture, the United States in the position of sons of Great Britain, it would have been very rapid and easy for America to humble itself to Britain. So the father said that uh, in 1984. And, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop now. There's loads more. But I'll stop wow. here. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm Thank you. Impressed. Thank you. <clears throat> How the Protestants didn't come to Korea. Uh, this Welsh person from South Wales became a anyway, singing about it, anyway, became a very profound Christian, became a missionary, and he took China, he went to the missionaries of China, he found out that there were Korean Christians but they had no Bibles. And so he took Chinese Bibles to Korea. In 1866 he went on this General Sherman, which was a boat, trading boat. There's a misunderstanding with the Koreans, they and the boat ran aground in the river and there's a clash and uh, you know, he was martyred. And he went on to the, left the boat, went on to the bank of the river, <coughs> distributing his Bibles, and he gave the last Bible to the man who beheaded him. And the Koreans then collected these Bibles, because they made a paper, it's very valuable, <coughs> and they wallpapered their houses. Oh. In, you know, and then when it was, you know, Chinese Bibles, wallpaper, then, anyway, you're sitting around, you get a bit bored, you start re you started reading the wallpaper and became Christians. <laughs> and that was the birth of Christianity, Protestant Christianity, in Korea. In, in Korea, was literally the Word of God. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, there's a Scotsman called John Ross. He translated the Bible into Korean, and he went to Korea and distributed it. So in that sense, Britain tried to give birth to, to mm -hmm. Korea and brought Christianity to Korea. So Korea has had a kind of status within the mm. UK. What? Korea has had a kind of status within the UK. Well, I mean... Because why did they choose Korea for that? They were guided by God. Okay. I mean, he became a missionary to China. He learned Chinese fluently. Mm -hmm. Then he just heard that there were Christians in Korea. Because <coughs> Christianity was illegal. It was against the law. If you're a Christian Korea, you, you would be put to death. In 1866, I think it was. Yeah, around about this time, actually. Okay. About 10,000 about 10, Catholics were martyred in Korea. Oh, they were put to death. Because it was against the law to be a, to be a Christian. Anyway, he heard that there were these Christians. They had no Bibles. So he went there and distributed Bibles at the risk of his life. And then this other person here, he... <coughs> Translated the Bible, and then incognito, you know, had to hide and pretend, dress yourself up so you look like a Korean, much as Korean as you could. <laughs> and then they just go around distributing Bibles. How did you learn this Korean? Sorry? How did you learn this Korean? Well, it, it was in, he went, again, he went as a missionary to China, and in China there were Koreans, so he could learn Korean from Koreans who were living in China. 
Well, so it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. You also learn Korean. Right? So, so a lot of missionaries from the UK yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean they were. I mean there were just lots of missionaries in those days, going from Britain to to China and to the Orient and to mm-hmm. Africa and all over the world. Mm-hmm. Now they're coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not in in Northwood. There's um, some a church in England uh, vicar who was a Korean. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'll stop. Thank you very much.